it's great to have Nick Riley back. So if you don't know, Nick was a, a student in my group, and then he went off and did a postdoc at Stanford, and now he's, this week, a, a, an official faculty member of, of uh, University of Washington in Seattle. So Nick's gonna tell us about data acquisition. Go for it, Nick. Thank you, Josh. I'm excited to be here, and uh, definitely of the same mindset of all the other presenters of love questions, happy to take questions at the end. If questions come up as we're going and everyone looks confused, I might pull the audience or ask for some audience participation just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, but yes, so first of all, I am very excited to be at the University of Washington now, the other UW, or as we say in, in Seattle, UW. It's taken me a long time to get used to UW instead of UW-Madison, but I'm finally getting there. Uh, this is beautiful campus, and uh, the chemistry building is just to the right of this fountain, so very excited to be there. Um, I have it on you know, good word that every day in Seattle looks just like this. Uh, I, mean, I don't quite know what the laughter is. Here's another day in Seattle. Same view, it's pretty beautiful. So I think, you know, right now I'm looking good. And then now, I guess the weather changed a bit. It's a little clearer so we could see Mount Rainier. But okay, all that to say, I, Josh did a good job introducing me, but I wanted to just give a brief background. I really like getting to know people, their stories, and where they've been in research. So briefly, from Kentucky, went to school in South Carolina, and then made the move up to the tundra of Wisconsin. And when I moved here, right about this time in 2012, things were looking good. And then polar vortexes started happening. It's like, what is going on? But really enjoyed my time in Josh's lab. Worked a lot on ETD and the fragmentation stuff you heard about earlier this morning. Um, and turned out that was really interesting to use for some post-translational modifications, especially glycopeptides. So my interest in glyco taught, brought me to my postdoc in Carolyn's lab, where I spent the past four and a half, five years working on glycoproteomics. And Carolyn uh, recently won the Nobel Prize. Super exciting time to be in her lab. Feel very lucky to have been under her mentorship. And through that, through both Josh and Carolyn's uh, you know, support, now super excited to be up in Seattle. You know, it's been fun to be back too because I was clicking on the site to see like, oh, where's the summer school schedule, everything like that, and a picture circa 2015 popped up. And you know, some things never change, some things hopefully do, maybe a better haircut. But it was fun to see like, oh, I actually did used to be here and still exist in, in the Kuhn Lab eyes that way. But okay, so for the conversation today, I know a lot of people have background in mass spec, so some of this might start out very low level, but I wanna make sure everyone's on the same page and just to talk about the context of where we're discussing acquisition methods. All of what we're gonna talk about today can be applied to proteomics, lipidomics, metabolomics, and all sorts of different ways you might want to think about the data you're acquiring. It would be slightly different methods for things like mass spec imaging that we aren't gonna talk about today, but I will say there'll be a strong proteomic slant, but know that, again, all this stuff can be applied to uh, most of these molecules you wanna study. And we know as proteomics, as you're learning this week, if you've heard before this week, it's a relatively complex workflow, or simple, depending on what other methods you're used to. Um, but we you know, had the step of going from our uh, biological collection of interest, generating peptides generally, collecting LCMS data, searching that data, getting quantification, and making some biological story. But sometimes we skip over, like, what is this data, how do we collect this data, how is what we collect and how we collect it affecting our ability to interpret biological information. So that's what we're gonna talk about in this next hour is how we think about acquiring mass spec data and why we make certain decisions in that process. So the second step here is the same language. We all wanna be speaking the same language and it is an alphabet soup of acronyms. It, starting with in, uh, fragmentation methods, there's just so many acronyms. We're gonna get like several more acronyms just now, so I wanted to make sure that I at least define these as, as we go, because this will probably be the only, one of the few times you actually see them written out throughout the talk, because they take up a lot of space if you don't just use the acronym. But DDA, something you've heard about today already, data dependent acquisition. We'll talk about that, but if I'm for, uh, forcing the idea of dependent, that must mean there is an independent version of this. So data independent would be DIA, data dependent DDA. From there, you heard also Rick yesterday and several other speakers have talked about things like SRM, or Selected Reaction Monitoring. This is the same thing as MRM. So I know this was confusing to me when I first started, like what are the differences between SRM and MRM? There's no difference. They are effectively the same. Uh, people prefer to use different uh, acronyms or uh, ways to describe it. For purposes today, we're gonna to focus on uh, SRM. I like the idea of SRM because you are selecting which fragments you're gonna look for, and we'll get into that again in a few slides. 
And then finally, PRM is a version of SRM that was expanded upon recently, and Josh's lab played a role in that that we'll talk about. Um, this is parallel reaction monitoring. So SRM and PRM, definitely related. DIA, DDA, def definitely related, but really, they're all related as we'll, as we'll discuss. Other definitions, again, I know most people are familiar with these things, but I'm gonna say several different words because it's just how it comes out when describing them. We think that things like MS1, that's the same thing as a full MS scan or a survey MS scan. This is where you are measuring at the intact peptide level. You have not fragmented, you have not selected anything to fragment at this point. The other words that come about, you heard this with chromatography, you heard about all these um, other terms that might have been thrown around today, but you know, we think about uh, along the time domain, the time axis and intensity, that's a chromatogram. You can have a total ion chromatogram or an MS1 chromatogram that's measuring mass to charges of that space. And you can also do a specific mass to charge, which would be an extracted ion chromatogram or XIC. So all these terms, you know, we'll kind of talk about and I might mention you know, if I don't explain them later so you kind of have an idea of what this looks like. So this would be an XIC of a specific mass to charge there. Of course, MS1, then we can do MS2. This is where we would mass select certain uh, M disease space in, uh, in our mass spectrometer and fragment things that would be in that space. You don't always have to fragment, but generally for today's purposes, we're thinking about doing some fragmentation on whatever we select to break them apart and see what fragments we can make sense of. Of course, beyond MS2, you could then select one of these fragments and fragment it again. That's where we get the idea of MS to the N. And so this is where, you know, we, if you haven't heard of tandem, or Rick mentioned MS to MS, 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 this is where it comes from, is that you keep doing stages of selection on your product ion spectra. Okay, so that's some of the vocabulary. The last thing I wanna make sure we're on the same page of is like this fundamental idea of what we do in tandem MS. And so these puzzle pieces look different depending on the type of acquisition you're using, what type of instruments you have, but in general, these puzzle pieces all have to fit together in the types of methods we're bit, uh, building. And so these steps are selection, fragmentation, and mass analysis, and detection. I put and detection there because as we heard from Rick yesterday, some mass analyzers have an external detector, some detect like image currents like we think of with FTMS, and so there's different ways the detection, but that mass analysis part is the key thing we want to, to focus on today. I think of the idea again of tandem MS because mass analysis one is coming in the selection stage. We are making some action based on a mass to charge value, and then we're then doing other actions based on mass to charge values. Here we're manipulating them so that we can measure them. So with this, you can then have all sorts of iterations and how you do selection fragmentation, mass analysis. And so we, we've heard a lot about how you would use quadruples, and this is by far the most common way to do the selection stage. You can also use ion traps to do selection too. I think Rick mentioned it yesterday, if not someone else. Um, you have an ion trap in the front of your instrument, you can use that and just isolate certain ion packets as well. When you get to the fragmentation stage, is what Josh talked about earlier this morning, there is a whole host of ways that you can imagine breaking apart your, your fragment or your peptide ions. Of course, collision-based methods are by far the most common and ones that we'll really think about the most today. And then the mass analysis side, this really comes in with Rick's lecture. It started out the program yesterday afternoon. Um, we could use quadrupoles, we can use ion traps, we can use ICRs or orbit traps. There's a lot of ways that we can do that mass analysis stage too. So at some point, you know, in your sleep, I hope you start thinking selection, fragmentation, mass analysis. We'll get there eventually. I might have you guys repeat it for me later. For data acquisition strategies, we can think about do we have targeted or untargeted? And you'll hear, I didn't write untargeted because it is a natural thing to say. So if I wanted to write discovery so that you see that word also. You see discovery proteomics, it is idea, that same idea as untargeted proteomics. We don't know what we're going after. We're targeted, we know exactly what we want to see, we're telling our mass spectrometer to look for certain things. So the other axis of this square we have then is, are we gonna make decisions during acquisition? Do we have to have the instrument make decisions for us as we're acquiring data? Or do we know exactly what we want to acquire and we're gonna tell the instrument, no, no, I have predetermined everything you need to do and you will do exactly as I say. And so these types of uh, decisions here would affect, the, or they, they, we can bin our methods into different categories. So data dependent, DDA, is gonna be a discovery method where we have the instrument actually make decisions on the fly for us. DIA is discovery as well, but we actually are telling the instrument exactly what to do no matter what data is there. 
And then that was thus the independent and dependent of those words, right? Dependent on the data that's present, so the instrument has to make decisions. Independent of what data is there, we're doing, it's, the instrument's gonna do what we decided before it sees any data at all. And then on the other side, we also make predetermined decisions because if we know what we're going after, we have to tell the instrument what to do in order to see what we want to see. And so these SRM and PRM methods fall in this targeted predetermined decision square. But I will say, as our methods have advanced, SRM and MRM also have the ability to do some on-the-fly decisions that we'll just very briefly touch on today. But it's an exciting time to think about how all these methods are really starting to blend together. And we're not gonna get to that because there's several layers of complexity about how these instruments or how these methods kind of work together in the most modern sense, but I will say we'll be able to delineate each type, and then maybe over uh, beers at the terrace we can talk about how they're starting to blend together later. First, let's talk about DDA. This is the most canonical. I know Josh mentioned it a lot this morning, and so uh, we'll start there. So let's imagine blank screen here. You're sitting in front of your mass spectrometer. You have something coming off. Let's say it's an LC column and you're sitting there, you don't have any software on the instrument to set up a method. You have to acquire the data yourself. So you're gonna sit in front of it and watch peaks appear. What might that look like? It might look something like this. Again, circa 2015, probably two decades before this, people actually had to worry about uh, how to do this type of decision making and acquire data uh, in real time with their own decisions. But here's an MS1 spectrum. The peptides have appeared in our mass spectrometer. And so we're gonna say, well, what peptide should I pick to fragment? Again, I don't have a method set up on my instrument to do this, I have to make the decision. Which peak am I gonna pick? Anyone have a thought? Tallest one, yeah, why is that? The strongest signal, the highest likelihood of success, right? If that's got the most signal, I bet I can sequence that one. I don't know, I have no idea if I can sequence any of these, but I should try the one that gives me the highest chance. Look. We pointed out we should, we should pick that one, and that one being the tallest one. So what this looks like, we then use our quadrupole, we isolate hopefully this specific peak. In most of these uh, discussions we're having today, we're assuming we're isolating in the one to two mass to charge range, it's one peptide. I will tell you that is not the case if you have very complex mixtures, but in your head, imagine we're trying to pick one species that we're isolating. We fragment that, we get an MS2 spectrum. Next, we go after the next tallest peaks. Why is that? Again, our highest likelihood of success. So we have designed our own data-dependent way of doing this, an algorithm that we came up with as we're sitting in front of the computer out of necessity to say our most likely option is to sequence the tallest, the second tallest, the next tallest, the fourth tallest, and so on. This is generally how data was collected before we were able to automate this, but it also has a pretty uh, strong logic in that we should spend time sequencing the things that have the highest likelihood first once we've acquired data for those, then we can spend more time going after things that have less likelihood. But we wanna make sure we sequence the things we should be able to sequence first. This is the very basic principle of data-dependent acquisition. So here I'm gonna show it in a different way and we're gonna get through both of these figures, but this is uh, just a different orientation of the same figure I showed you, where we have selected different peaks and we have MS2 spectra for each of those roughly two uh, mass charge unit isolation windows. What this looks like if we start adding in a time component here, when we can, you know, we have built methods to do this on our instruments now, is that we can pick peaks in the mass to charge base and we're picking them based on their intensity. So we're picking that one and we fragment it. And then we can pick other ones that's in this space um, that we are able to fragment. And again, the black lines here are MS1 spectra. So we take an MS1 spectra, we see what's there, and then we pick a bunch of the tallest, the first tallest peaks, fragment them, and then once we've gotten through some amount of time, we take another MS1 to see what peptides are there again. There is a time component, of course, to this, as we allude to here, that there's some elution profile, as we think about the chromatography and the separations that we had earlier, of how long we have to make these decisions. How long can I pick that peak before it's gone, before it has eluded off my column and it is never more? And so here uh, we have th these decisions to make and design our DDA methods to maximize our ability to pick all these peaks. And also you can see in the time component here of our MS2 spectra, we just have an MS2 at a single moment in time and an MS2 for a different species at a single moment in time. And so this is the basic principle of how DDA is set up. And also I wanna point out that because of this time component, we don't always wanna pick these same things because other things are co-eluting at the same time. And so we have this idea of what we call dynamic exclusion, and that's really to maximize all the different species that we can see 
as things are co-alluding together in the, in the same moment, there's a lot of peptides in our mass spectrometer. So what dynamic exclusion says is do not pick these precursors again for some amount of time. How long is that amount of time? Well, that depends on a lot of things. We heard about all the separations and how quickly or how long you can do a separation across, and so that will very much determine how long you might set your dynamic exclusion. And so this retention time dimension determines a lot of this, and roughly, depending on the, so many parameters, but I'd say in the tens of seconds, tens to about 60 seconds is how long we set dynamic exclusion windows to be. So we're saying, you know, if this peak has some elution profile of 20 seconds, if depending on air chromatography, I don't want to pick it more than a few times across its elution profile. And if it's super low abundant, I probably will only pick it once. What does this look like in practicality? So this is a paper from the Kuhn Lab where we were looking at how deep instruments can sample into a mass spectrum. So if you were to look at this without having any prior knowledge that this is happening 55 minutes into a gradient, you'd say, well, why didn't we pick that peak or that peak or that peak or that peak or any of these tall peaks? Well, it, because we've already sampled them and they're on our dynamic exclusion list. And this allows us to dig deeper into those peak depths. Now things that are, look like us to be in the grass relative to these tall peaks, we're able to sample them. And this is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, probably one of the best case scenarios where most of these that are sampled turn into peptide identification. So each species that was isolated by our quadrupole and fragmented, we are able to then map back to a peptide sequence. And so all of these low abundant peaks <clears throat> are still quite valuable and we want to make sure we sample them. So then what does this look like? How do we set up the DDA method? What is our instrument doing to do all of these things? Well, it really depends on the type of instrument that you're using. And so again, we're gonna stay relatively high level. There are a lot of nuance, especially as instruments get more complicated. Um, but for now, just we think of the more straightforward platforms like the QTOF and the, the Q Orbitrap being where we have a quadrupole that's doing mass selection, some collision cell, and notice that's the low, lowercase q, and then our mass analyzer at the back end. And so again, the mass analyzer of the quadrupole being the big Q, the collision cell, and then the detector and mass analyzer. So the way that we set this up is if you're doing mass analysis in the same analyzer slash detector um, for the MS1 spectra as you are for the MS2 spectra, you have to wait until your MS1 spectra have been acquired until you can collect your MS2. Now the speed of a TOF versus the speed of an Orbitrap is substantially different, but that's not what we're here to debate today, but it's more just to think about wh what order of operations happen. So I take an MS1 scan and then I see what's there and then I can take a bunch of MS2 scans after that. One question, why a gap between all of these scans? Anyone have any idea? Yes. Beautiful, yes. You have to have ions there in order to analyze. And so, again, how instruments accumulate ions, how long they need to accumulate ions for, is very dependent on the platform itself. But the idea that you need to be able to accumulate before you can fragment. So you have to have some population of ions there. So the next thing would be, like, what if we didn't have to use the same mass analyzer for MS1 as we do for MS2? That's where you heard about things like the tribrid and these more complex instrument platforms that have multiple mass analyzers and orientations that allow you to parallelize functions. And so here you can see, as you've seen this before, but I wanna reiterate because it's a super you know, useful concept to understand is we have our quadrupole here, a collision cell slash an ion routing multipole. So you can just hold ions here if you wanted to, but this is where HCD fragmentation happens. You can then detect an orbit trap or detect an ion trap. So what if you did your MS1 scan, this full scan as you see here, and we detect all of these peptides, and you do that in the orbit trap? Well, that takes some amount of time to do analysis in the orbit trap. The instrument's just sitting there if you're not doing anything else. But because of this orientation, we're now able to parallelize this so that we can collect ions, store them here, and if we wanted to wait to do orbit trap mass analysis, at least they're hanging out there ready to analyze. We've already accumulated them. But what if we decided to use the ion trap to mass analyze instead? So now we're able to collect an MS1 scan in the orbit trap. Ions are circulating around that central electrode. And at that same time, we're then saying, well, I know what the, you know, I'm gonna pull up the next slide just in case, or just to help explain this. So we took a full scan, scan A. Based on that, we start taking a full scan. This is happening in the orbit trap, scan B. So MS1 intact peptides. But we know what peptides are generally there because we just measured them in scan A. So we're gonna pick uh, decisions on what peptides to fragment based on that scan we just took. So we're kind of in plus one off of you know, our MS1 collection, but we're able to then parallelize this function. So the entire time that we're taking an MS1, 
we're collecting fragmentation spectra, and that instrument is happening, you know, is, is using its time wisely. So this is the idea of parallelization, and has been super beneficial in, in um, a lot of DDA experiments in particular. All right, so now thinking about uh, the idea of stochastic sampling. So we're like, all right, we have our instruments running as fast as they can. We're collecting as many spectra as we can. Can we sample everything in our uh, MS1 spectrum as it's eluding from our column? The short answer is absolutely not. Uh, instruments are infinitely fast, then yes, but there's so much time we have to consider for all of these things. And so we can see here that uh, the stochasticity is, is obvious when you think about what these lines mean. Again, this straight black line, is an MS1 scan, and these gray dots are MS2 scans. You can see that they're just kind of sprinkled across the mass to charge space, this space, in time. And so we're like saying, oh, we can pick at this mass to charge, that mass to charge, that mass to charge, but there's no real rhyme or reason. It's just about abundance and what happens to appear in our mass spectrometer at that time. And so again, just to highlight what's happening here, we just say, all right, this one we selected with some two uh, mass to charge isolation window. We fragmented it, and it turned to this peptide. So this is happening for each of these dots. Not each dot will be translated to an identification, but that's, that's the goal that we're hoping to get after. The challenge, though, is that because we can't identify each of these dots, and because if this is experiment one, maybe this dot, this species, wasn't picked in experiment two. If we re-ran the same sample, who is to say if that peptide will be the most abundant at any given moment when we've taken an MS1? And so this stochasticity, this idea of a random distribution of probability, says that we're going to have missing values. And so you see, if we have samples across the top and proteins across the side here, there are some proteins that aren't detected in certain samples. And this becomes a challenge when you're trying to do quantitative proteomics and compare a lot of biological conditions. There are ways around this so that we won't talk about today. You'll hear about in some informatics sessions. But this still is a, the, the major challenge of data dependent. Now, we'll say that data dependent is incredibly straightforward to set up. And we'll do a comparison of all these methods at the end. But if you don't know exactly what you want to do with your mass spectrometer, the best bet is to try data dependent because it's relatively straightforward conceptually and method methodologically to set up that way. One last thing I'll say is just a reminder of the heat and this heat map is all uh, quantification coming from area under the curve measurements. So again, each of these species we're measuring at certain intervals at MS1. So we're able to measure at the MS1 intact peptide level these XICs for each mass to charge species, and we can map some of these back to peptide information, and that's how we're getting our quantitative information that way. All right, questions on that before we move forward? Cool. So the next thing I want to talk about is the complete opposite. We're now not going to say we want to discover anything or we're going to have the instrument make decisions for us. We're going to say, I know exactly what I want to see, and here's what I want you to do, instrument. And so these are the SRM and PRM methods. So first, SRM happens on triple quadrupoles. And so this is, again, Rick talked about this yesterday. He was you know, instrumental, no pun intended, in developing the first triple quadrupole. And so here you have the ability to select a single ion, a uh, single mass of charge space. You fragment that in your second quadrupole, and then you do mass analysis on a single mass of charge value. So here they're shown separate because we are going to measure the green one first. And that's the only thing we're going to allow to pass through Q3. So we've only measured fragments, the green fragment period. And then after we've measured the green fragment, we will measure the blue fragment. After we've measured the blue fragment, we will measure the red fragment. So we have these different spectra that are our transitions or fragments from our peptide of interest. Or again, this could be small molecules or whatever uh, species might be interested in. The difference between SRM and PRM is in this stage. And again, you heard hinted at this yesterday. Um, the idea that we're still going to select one mass to charge range, one species, fragment it in our second quadrupole, but now our detection is going to be quote unquote multiplexed. We are no longer detecting a single mass to charge ion. We are going to instead detect uh, all of the fragments at once using either an orbit trap or a TOF system. Or you could do ion traps too. There's a lot of ways to imagine this. And so you really are just changing the, the third position, and that changes the amount of information you get per scan. So in order to set up a targeted experiment, you generally have to do the discovery experiment first. So before you can even think about SRM or PRM, you've probably done some version of discovery, maybe a DDA experiment. So here you've extracted your proteins, digested into peptides, done your LCMS, searched everything, had your peptide indications, and generally know what proteins you care about, what you might want to look for in the next experiment or the, your targeted runs. So the way that you then set up your targeted experiment, you've determined your proteins of interest, coming again from the, your discovery experiment. 
And you say, well, what peptides did I detect? What peptides am I most likely to detect often? And these, we're not gonna go into details of this because each one of these could be, uh, methods could be an entire you know, semester long course if we wanted it to be. Um, but there are reasons you'd pick certain peptides over others, mainly how often do they generate triptych peptides, what charges do they have, all those types of things. And you develop uh, your targeted assay. And so you here they have an example of a quadrupole. You get some trace for your, only for your peptides of interest and then you can determine concentrations that way. So what might this look like? How do we, does this you know, nebulous develop assay? Uh, let's talk a little bit what that looks like. Again, this could go far more in depth if you're interested, but we don't have time today to go too much more. Um, but the idea being that we know we wanna look at this protein and we know that this is the proteotypic peptide. We've seen this peptide in our discovery experiments. So we know it's there, we know it's detectable, and we know generally what time it eludes. So there's a lot of information that's very useful for us. With this, we can then say, I wanna make an internal standard. I'm gonna synthesize a peptide and make a heavy version of it using isotopes of some sort. You can use chemical labeling, you can use heavy isotopes in the synthesis process, you can do a lot of different ways. But I'm gonna spike this internal standard into a mixture that has the uh, target peptide. And basically, our ability to have the matrix we wanna study is gonna have our internal standard in it, and we put certain amounts of our internal standard. So that gives us the ability to make a standard curve. We now have concentrations that give us response. How much signal should I expect to see if I have blank number of atomoles of my peptide around? Then we go to our quantitative, uh, the targeted proteomic experiment itself where we have the sample we wanna study. In our target protein, we expect to be in that sample. And so we're gonna digest and get it ready for proteomics. And then we're gonna spike in the same standard that we've determined uh, that we want to, to measure. And we use that standard as a way to measure both the heavy thing that we put in there at some known amount, and also the target peptide that's the endogenous source of this peptide. And that gives us some response, and we know that that response should fall on our standard curve, giving us some amount of idea of how much is there. Now, the way this quantitation works, and if you've set up your standard curve to actually measure something, what limits of quantification really look like, that's where we start talking about the semester-long course on uh, targeted proteomics. But know that there's a lot that goes into this, and targeted proteomics might seem straightforward, but I would argue it is the, the method that takes the most time to develop months generally to get this assay working, but once it works, that's where you have situations like what Rick was describing where you can use this for newborn screening, you can use this for all sorts of medical and clinical reasons. And so this is where most clinical proteomics is using some kind of targeted method, whether it be SRM or PRM, which we're about to talk about. So uh, I should mention too, uh, the way that we do quantification is we're actually gonna uh, do quantification through the fragment ion chromatograms. So if this is MRM, this would be fragment ion chromatograms that were collected in individual spectra, each at a time with our quadrupole. In this situation, do we think this is SRM or PRM spectra that we might have collected? PRM, why do we think that? There are multiple fragments, right? So if it's a SRM measurement, we'd only have one fragment per spectrum, similar to what we saw in that first slide where we've only measured a single mass of charge value per mass analysis. In the PRM spectrum, we've collected all the fragments from this peptide and measured them all at once. So we've quote unquote multiplexed our targeted identification. With this, uh, we are also able to collect this over some course of time because we're telling our instrument just fragment this peptide and we are just sitting on that mass of charge value and collecting fragment spectra so we can see fragments appear and as the peptide eludes off our column, disappear. So we're able to quantify now on multiple species and this gives us the ability to have really robust quantification when we're going after targeted species that way. One thing that's important to know though is not, just because you have all of these fragments here doesn't mean all of them are useful. Some of these might be interfering. You can imagine that I'm telling the instrument to select my peptide of interest, which is at 500 mass to charge, but there might be other peptides at a given moment in time that also have 500 mass to charge that have very similar sequence, thus they're co-eluding and in the same mass to charge window. So sometimes you have to refine what fragments you actually use. So here we have a you know, heavy version. This is the spiked in standard, so to speak, that we talked about of our internal standard. The light version being the endogenous, so we can quantify them at the MS1 level but we can also quantify their fragments. And so we had these, this would be again a PRM spectrum because we have a bunch of fragments from this targeted peptide. But these fragments aren't all useful. Some of them are co not, don't co perfectly co-elute or very noisy or might be from 
uh, you know, an interfering species. So we have to select those out. And this is, again, a reason that the targeted proteomics methods take quite a while to develop, because you have to go in and check to make sure that your PRM or SRM measurements are free of interference, and you actually get robust quantification that way. So this is another reason that uh, the targeted methods can be very powerful, because you have the ability to say, I know exactly what I'm looking for. I have spiked in exactly what I expect to be there. And now I can really refine my data so that I am 100% sure what I'm measuring is actually what I think it is. The challenge with targeted methods is that we generally have to schedule them. If we just told the instrument to sit on a certain number of masses for the entire time we're acquiring data, let's say it's a 30 minute run for a clinical proteomics analysis, if we, only, if we told the instrument to look for a certain number of peptides the entire time, that limits the number of peptides we can look at. So if we can schedule and say, I only want you to look for some peptides in the first part of the gradient, some in the middle part of the gradient, and some should only be at the end of the gradient, I know that because I've done the discovery experiment and seen where those peptides elute. So this is what we call conventional uh, scheduled targeting methods, where we say, all right, peptide one will be from minute one to five, and peptide two will be from minute four to eight, or whatever it might be. Now, a challenge comes with kind of what we heard from Bob that you know, things don't always stay the same when it comes to retention time. Things, uh, many factors can affect elution time and how quickly or uh, not quickly things come off of columns. So if you have some reference run where you have a peptide that eluded at this time, and all of a sudden maybe you're collecting it on a different instrument or maybe your column overpressured and you had to replace that column in the middle of a batch of 200 samples or something like that, now all of a sudden your elution time is different and your scheduling can't be relied upon. This is, a, you know, for a long time in the field, this is where we were in thinking about how to you know, improve targeted methods. So this is where I say that we're starting to blend these ideas of targeted acquisition, but we're gonna make decisions, have the instrument make decisions for us based on real-time information. And so what that we can do, we can spike in peptides that we don't care about. These are not from our protein of interest, but we're spiking in reference peptides that then tell us generally an elution order. So we know that this peak should come first, this peak should come second, third, fourth, and fifth. And so now, if even if our elution gets pushed back a little bit, we still know if we have, if this first peak hasn't eluded, it means that our peptide has also not eluded because the elution order itself is conserved even if the retention time is different. And so this elution order is super useful and we can tell our instruments to look for these internal references of our elution uh, timing of our peptides and say like, all right, I don't need you to schedule peptide one sampling, don't even look for it until you've seen elution anchor peptide one. And once you've seen anchor peptide two, peptide one is definitely not there anymore, it's off the column, so stop even looking for it. So this ability to schedule these things is really, uh, and again, in real time with the elution order algorithms has been very beneficial. Um, and we can also use things where we spike in uh, these triggered methods where we say like, all right, I wanna spike in a peptide that is not, or that is uh, heavy labeled. My endogenous peptide may be so low that I can't even see it. But if the instrument sequences this heavy peptide I spiked in, I'm now gonna just sit on the mass of my light peptide, even if I can't see it in my MS1, I know it should be there because my heavy spiked in peptide is coming, and now I can acquire targeted spectra for that. So it really increases our sensitivity. So it's very uh, beneficial to think about how we are blending methods together of using kind of online decision making with targeted methods where we know what we should be looking for. All right, so the few other things that you may not think of uh, that SRM and PRM are used for, generally, like we, we broadly, when I think of it first, things like clinical proteomics comes to mind. There's a lot of cool questions you can ask where you have a targeted assay that you don't need to survey the entire proteome. For example, let's say that um, you wanted to look for specific proteins that have abundance uh, patterns. This is like the most common that we'd expect to look for in uh, a targeted proteomics experiment. But what if you were looking for protein complexes that had certain stoichiometry? How does that stoichiometry change? Is it uh, affected by some chemical treatment or some biological perturbation that we've done? Well, we can set up targeted proteomics to only look for peptides from our complex of interest, thus giving us a sensitivity that we may not have in discovery proteomics. Also, I skipped over this part, my bad, that this uh, method in particular is saying, I'm really interested in a certain metabolic pathway. I don't care about any of the rest of the proteome. I just, in this experiment, I want to measure all the proteins in this metabolic pathway, so I'll set up a targeted experiment to only look at those. And we heard a little bit about that yesterday at the, the end of the day lecture, too. <clears throat> 
And then also signaling pathways, same idea of like going after specific things, or if in particular you can look at modified peptides, phosphopeptides being the best example of this, where you can set up targeted methods to look for phosphorylation states. And people have done this, for example, looking at kinase loops. And we know that kinase loops are an indication of how active a kinase might be. And can we say like, oh, under this biological perturbation, kinases of this family are turned on or turned off. And we can study that with uh, high selectivity and sensitivity that way. And then finally, other metabolic or uh, post-translational modifications, we can then look at patterns on specific proteins, things like histones. If we know, for example, histones have certain patterns of methylation or phosphorylation that we want to look at, we can then uh, set up targeted methods for that as well. And then biomarkers, again, this is where I think what I, I immediately go to with targeted proteomics is the clinical side. But OK. Now I think it comes to the interesting part and somewhat complicated part uh, of how to imagine these methods meeting in the middle and forming what we think of as data independent acquisition. So here, again, discovery methods, but we're telling the instrument what to do and what does this even mean? So let's look back at this idea where we have a single mass of charge selected, fragmenting it, and measuring individual fragment ions at a time. PRM, single ion frag uh, selected, fragmented, measuring all of the ions at, at the same time. In DIA, we are now not selecting just one, but some window where multiple species are being selected at the same time. So we have multiple things. There's no longer the assumption of just one peptide in our window, but now we have multiple peptides that we know. We have created this challenge for ourselves. We fragment them all and we measure all the fragments that way. We think about the sensitivity, what this might look like, or the, the specifications of this. With PRM and SRM, we definitely get the sensitivity, specificity, and reproducibility that we want. And the DIA methods have really tried to focus on how to improve, especially the reproducibility angle of this. This plot doesn't have DA, DDA on it, but the reproducibility would be the, the biggest hit relative to these target methods, and and all along with sensitivity and specificity as well. Um, and what we see with DIA is that it is worse than the targeted methods, but again, this is happening in a discovery experiment. We no longer have to tell what the instrument to look for. So the gains that we have or the fact that it's even close to being as reproducible and as sensitive as targeted methods is pretty impressive. So then let's think about this relative to DDA. With DDA, again, we have selected what we think to be individual peptide species and fragmented them. With DIA, we are now saying, do not pick things that you see, only iterate across the mass to charge space. So we are going to say, first, I'm going to select this window, and I will fragment everything in this window, regardless of what's there. Then I will select this window and do the same, this, and so on. So then we have these uh, fragmentation of everything that's in that window, and we have a spectrum that represents multiple peptides or other molecules that are there. So I'm going to show you this in several ways to make sure that this idea clicks. So there's going to be several diagrams that generally highlight the same idea. Uh, this one shows, again, where we have retention time, and at any given moment in our retention time, we take an MS1, and we say, I want to peak, pick that peak. We fragment that peak because we've selected it with our quadrupole at some somewhat small isolation window. And then we have an MSMS -MS spectra. This is DDA. For DIA, we have the same MS1 that we've taken at a certain retention time. But again, we are not going to select anything in particular, but just say, this is the general mass of charge space that I have told the instrument to fragment. And I've collected fragment ion spectra for everything in that window. Yet again, one more way to look at this. This is the same uh, figure we looked at earlier with DDA. So to walk through again, just we've picked this fragment that exists in this mass of charge space, and we have a fragment spectrum for it. And these have an elution profile at the MS1 level, because we're measuring them again with some time uh, consistency. But each fragment spectrum itself only exist at one moment. For DIA, instead, we are going to pick this entire window. So we will have iterated across. You can see here, these are the, the windows that we're isolating with our quadrupole. They're now 20 mass to charge units instead of two mass to charge units wide or even larger. And so with this, uh, you're able to then fragment a large number of things, and you have fragment ions from each of these peptides. But you do this in a reproducible fashion. So you just iterate across the mass to charge space, and once you're done, you do it again. And then you take, uh, you've done it one, you've done your cycle number two, and the cycle number three, you're going to do the same thing. So what this gives you then is this reproducible fragment ion spectra that you're taking in time. So you now have elution profiles of fragment ion spectra two that look very similar to what we would have had in a targeted proteomics experiment. So we're going to look at it in one other way, one other figure that's, again, the same idea, but I hope all of these, one figure might work for some and one might work for others.
So this is, again, yet another figure we looked at with DDA, where we pick stochastically in space between, between in mass to charge space between M each MS scan. We are selecting these for MS, MS, and creating a fragment ion spectra that generally represents just one peptide per isolation window, and you can see that here. Again, with our DIA, we are setting up windows that iterate across the entire mass to charge space. And you can set up methods that take MS1 scans at intervals. Some DIA methods don't even take MS1 scans. They just rely on MS2, where they just have these iterations across. So there's all sorts of flavors of this that come um, as we're developing these methods. But you can see here that with this 20 mass to charge isolation window, now we have multiple things. And we're going to have fragment ions that exist in the mass to charge space and in the time domain that we now have elution profiles for. So then how do we imagine, I guess I should say, general nod of the head. Is this starting to click? Is it making sense to most people? OK, I see a lot of nods. If, if not, we'll talk about We can ask questions at the end. But then how do we start setting up a DIA experiment? And how do I know even how to match fragments that come from all of these peptide to some identification? So in D DA, we generally can go from biological specimen, digestion. You can fractionate. We talked to, you know, Bob talked about all these ways to separate your samples and get better um, separation of species. But you could go straight to your DDA analysis, collect mass spectra, and search it and get peptides. Relatively straightforward. In DIA, you need to do some extra steps. And generally what this looks like is we have our you know, biological specimen, and we're going to have our uh, same digestion protocols as here. But now we're going to combine them all and fractionate them into this really large library that will be all peptides that could be there. And we're going to collect that data via DDA. So we are doing a DDA experiment with offline fractionation by default in this scenario. But what we've also done is collected SWATH being just a special name for DIA, um, that we also have the ability to collect our DIA methods on all of our data. So each of these methods are being collected on individual samples, whereas this DDA library is being built with a combination of all samples. And now we can combine peptides we have identified with our DDA uh, methods and say these are the peptides that should be there. We now can make libraries of what their fragment spectra look like, and we should match what fragments we see in DIA spectra to our known peptide sequences from our DDA library. So it gets a little confusing to think about how this might work, and why would you even bother doing two experiments on the same sample? Well, if you have 100 samples, and you need to measure the same 3,000 proteins across all of these samples, the reproducibility of DIA methods, where you're measuring, again, the same mass to charge windows across the same point in time throughout every experiment, will give you the generally very few missing values of proteins um, that you are able to get. Whereas if you were to do DDA in all 100 samples, you would definitely have missing values. So we, you, the ability to do one big DDA experiment just to get a pool of identifications that should exist, and then to do your uh, actual acquisition on each individual sample uh, with DIA gives you the ability to have the reproducibility and the sensitivity, but also the discovery mode that you're saying, I didn't know what peptides were going to be in there until we added this library in. Now, it gets way more interesting and in, like, uh, way, things, ways that people have come up with to improve this process, especially this library generation, has been an exciting space in the, in the fragmentation methods. So I want to talk about like several big concepts, and this is going to like hit the accelerator on some ideas. So if you get lost at this stage, it is OK, because we're going to start talking about more complexity, because DIA methods, people have been very creative in how they're being used. But first, DDA again, we see this stochastic sampling. With targeted methods, we've said take MS2s, these blue lines, at certain times, because these are the peptides that we want to look for at certain mass to charge values at certain times. In DIA, we then have these iterations across the mass to charge space. Again, this is time down this axis, the y axis. So we've taken uh, MS2 of some large window, and we keep just iterating across the mass to charge space. We do it again and again. You can also change how wide these windows get. So depending on your instrument style, you can say we have uh, wider windows at this mass to charge space, narrow window windows. If there are a lot of peptides that elute in this mass to charge region, maybe we want narrow windows, windows to help with specificity. And there are very few peptides out in this space, so we'll have bigger windows again. 
Now, the thing I find really interesting, this idea of staggered windows, you can see here in first iteration, we go across some, across the massive charge space. In the second iteration, we have shifted these windows. So you see that the edge of this window is now the middle of that window. And that gives us a selectivity that we'll look at on the next slide. Um, but the last thing is you could uh, imagine then doing, well, what if I had enough sample to just inject six times, and I just wanted to in do shorter methods, or the ability to say, I only want to identify peptides from 500 to 400 to 500 mass charge units in one injection, and the second injection just 500 to 600, and so on. This gives you a sensitivity that you may be able to use uh, beneficially that we'll look at in a few slides, too. So the idea of staggered windows, and again, this slide is relatively complex, but I point out that we have on um, this time point T minus one, a window where a green peptide exists and a blue does not, and a window where a blue peptide exists but a green does not. We've now shifted the windows by a little bit where blue and green both exist in the same isolation window. But in the next iteration, we go back and we have isolation windows where only green exists or only blue exists. So what we can look at as our fragment spectra, we see in these, the T minus one, we have a spectrum that only blue fragment, or excuse me, only fragments from the green peptide are present. And here we have fragments only from the blue peptide. In this T zero, we have a spectrum that has both green and blue, because we see it's co-isolated, but immediately in the next cycle, it's back to being only green or only blue. Uh, the red is here to show that it's present in all the above, so we can't say anything about the red one. But what we can say is that because we see this present, 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 and then not present, present, not present, we can demultiplex and say the blue does not belong in this mass to charge space, but must belong to that mass to charge space. And we can demultiplex computationally in our fragment spectra to say we know that the green it belongs together and we know that the blue belong together. That's how we can simplify our spectra, and this gives us now the ability, instead of having 24 uh, mass to charge unit windows, it's effectively a 12 mass to charge unit window, because we've cut it in half, saying that only things in this half belong, and we can you know, do this across windows that way, too. One other thought is how we could imagine building libraries without having to do a massive DDA experiment. So here we have a whole bunch of samples, we pool them together, as I mentioned with the uh, gas phase fractionation, this idea of GPF, um, that we can, with this pooled sample, so this is all samples combined into one tube, we will do six runs, just six. We don't have to do a lot of DDA, we don't have to do a lot of fractionation. We just do six runs where we use uh, only the isolation of certain mass to charge spaces across the entire run. This gives us a sensitivity, and we can do this in a DIA fashion, like just like we looked at on this slide. We're basically doing this, injection one, only going from 400 to 500 to uh, uh, injection two from 500 to 600 mass to charge. And so now we can build a library just on these DIA methods and use that to search our large DIA spectra where we went from 400 to 1,000 mass to charge. So again, this method is being used for each sample individually. So we've collected you know, 40, spec 40 samples for each of the, uh, this experiment, but we also have six library fractions that we are able to then generate a library and search our data with that instead. So again, a little bit complex, but it's definitely uh, an emerging thought in the field of how we can get better at using libraries that are sample specific, because this library is not collected in some other lab, it's not a reference library that's on some random HeLa cell line that you hope looks like your HeLa cell line. It's actually from the samples you're interested in looking at. And so this gives a lot of power and the ability to generate a library specifically from the samples you're analyzing. And then one last thing I'll mention too, this same idea, you can see here they have this, um, a whole batch of samples here, Let's start down there. This is the samples of interest. They've also made uh, a combination sample, what they call QC, or quality control, but they have a combination of all of these. So this sample has every protein that should exist in the experiment. They do this gas phase fractionation using very narrow windows, and so they're able to get very specific identifications of their peptides in this library. And they're not just doing this, but they're also adding in the ability to predict what spectra look like. And this is where we've seen a huge step change in our ability to create better libraries, is the ability to predict fragmentation spectra better is certainly helping. And so um, this, entire, this was an entire project from a you know, different group that did this, that this is all publicly available work now called Prosit. But it's absolutely helped in our ability to say, well, here's a peptide, what it should look like based on these prediction algorithms. Here's what our actual fragments look like. Can we 
use the combination of what we think to be the right peptides, oh, they actually look like they should because we know the predicted spectrum, and we use that to build the library we're gonna uh, use for our actual samples of interest. So this is, again, a lot of space to, to explore and think about because there's a lot of activity here as, as things keep changing. So I'll say, uh, if it seems, if you're in the mass spec field, I'm you know, kind of wrapping up the talk here, but if you're in the mass spec field and you're like, how do I keep up with all of these DIA methods, I will say, I don't really know, there's a lot of them. Even this, pub, this uh, method came out, in or this paper came out in 2022. Since then, there have been at least four major advances in DIA acquisition strategies. And so it's really, it's a rapidly uh, changing field. It's an exciting time. And as new instruments come about, they change the ways that we can collect this data and how we can improve how we use our ions that are coming into the mass spectrometer at any given time. This is a list from the same review of a bunch of different uh, t names of methods and the types of instruments that they're on. So you can see that there's uh, things like the TIMSTOF, which is a relatively new instrument platform that's generated a lot of excitement. A lot of the Orbitrap, so this is a tribrid platform. This is the QQ Orbitrap platform. Um, we have, uh, let's see, QTOFs up here. So there's all sorts of different instruments you can develop these types of methods on as well. And again, this is already outdated by the fact that you know, it existed six months too early before all these new methods came out. Um, then to kind of wrap up and go back to big picture, we have da data dependent, DDA, data independent, DIA, and our targeted methods, which would be SRM or PRM. What are they good at? What are, they, what are their challenges? Well, the ease of acquisition is the best in DDA. You can walk up to an instrument, almost every instrument has a DDA method built in. You say, just pick peptides based on their abundance, exclude the most abundant ones you've already sampled for some amount of time, and let's get some data going. And so this is what really DDA excels at. It also very much excels at things like post-translational modifications where you don't know exactly what you should be identifying. I'm in the glyco world, sorry. Uh, so I think about glycopeptides, and there's a lot of challenges in identifying glycopeptides. We do DDA the vast majority of the time. Now, DIA methods are getting better for those types of things, but DDA still wins there. The ease of data analysis, also the best in DDA, but it's getting better in DIA, I would say. I would also say for targeted methods, uh, data analysis is straightforward once you have a method developed, but it takes a lot of effort to get that method set. So it's not that it's hard, it just takes a lot of effort and careful uh, curation of your data sets to know what you're looking for. And because of that reason, I think that's why they rank this the hardest of uh, the type of acquisition, because it takes a while to get these methods established. Now when it comes to breadth of proteins and the idea that you can identify a lot of things, DDA and DIA are approaching, again, similar places. There was a time when DDA was far better, DIA has caught up, and then there are arguments in the field. If you go to any mass spectrometry meeting, you will, it, it's less of an argument now, everyone's just kind of accepted they're gonna coexist, but I'd say in like the mid-2010s, it was, you know, so people were throwing haymakers in the question session about DDA versus DIA. Uh, again, the breadth of proteins uh, sequencing and targeted is very low because you're only going after certain proteins you care about. But then I think when you think about reproducibility and the ability to look at sensitivity, that's where we see targeted methods being the winner, but DIA offering you this reproducibility in particular because you're measuring, again, consistently, regardless of what peptides enter your mass spectrometer, you're collecting the same mass spectra across the, the um, time. So then, just to end, wanted to reiterate this square of like discovery with decisions being made in real time. That's DDA. Discovery where you're telling the instrument exactly what to do. You're saying go iterate across these windows no matter what. That's DIA. If you say, I know what I want to look for, and please look for these peptides, uh, that's the predetermined decisions that we have with targeted methods with SRM and PRM. And again, SRM and PRM are getting interesting and kind of converging towards this. Uh, we don't know exactly when to do what we want you to do, but you can decide that on your own based on the algorithm we've given you type of idea. So then, one last thing to make sure this sticks and you repeat it in your sleep again tonight. What does this say? Selection, fragmentation, mass analysis. So we think of every method you're gonna work for, they're gonna have these components when you're designing methods. So always be thinking about how these pieces fit together when you're trying to figure out what's the best method for my biological question. And then finally, to just reiterate the differences, here we have selection of one thing, fragmentation, measurement of one thing. Selection of one thing, fragmentation, measurement of all things. Selection of multiple things, Fragmentation, measurement of all things. <laughs>
All right, so with that, thanks to the organizers for letting me be here. Uh, thanks to funding sources, and also super excited to look at Mount Rainier every day because it's never going to rain. Uh, and happy to answer questions now, happy to talk after this. I'll be around all week, so looking forward to talking to you all. Okay. Questions? Go ahead. Thank you for your talk. I'm really interested in incorporating DIA in our sample analysis, and I was just trying to understand how to best incorporate um, like doing the DDA first and what that would look like. Like, would it be taking a pooled sample and having that run with my overall batch and then gathering the data from that to then um, make sense of the DIA? Yeah, so there are a few options you have. The lowest investment from your side is to use a public library that exists. So someone who may have looked at your sample type before, if you're lucky, might have a library that you can download and use to search your DIA data so you wouldn't need to do any DDA. Now that has a lot of problems because their instruments look different, their retention times are different, like all these types of things that help your data improve with DIA, you don't have with that lowest effort option. The next option would be kind of what you said, you pull a sample. You want to fractionate so you can get the depth of the proteome. So you want to see, you want to be able to build a library of every peptide that exists in that sample. So in order to get that depth, that's why we do the offline fractionation. So that, that's why you have a pooled sample because every protein should be there. You fractionate it, and then you have your library that you search your DIA data with. And so that library is built with the DDA methods. Now the way that I first did my DIA experiments, a lot of acronyms here. Uh, is to do this gas phase fractionation using the DIA methods, where we you run six runs. And each of them only goes from like 100 mass to charges across, and that's working on a pooled sample. I didn't have to do any DDA. I only did DIA methods, and the software exists on several platforms now to translate each six of those library runs into an actual library of spectra. And the reason that is, let me, if I can go back really quick, is that the windows here are incredibly small. So we're actually only using an effective two Thompson window, two master charge unit window, in these isolation bins because they are the stacked, they are four master charge units wide, but they're staggered. So the effective isolation is two master charge. That looks, this, that's the same isolation width you would use in a DDA experiment. So that selectivity is there and you can use that small of a window because you're only going across a very small mass to charge space. So you have the time to do really small windows and iterate across that way. And then uh, you, in the next round, you only go you know, this 100 mass to charge units. And so that selectivity gives you the ability to create very robust libraries that are coming from the sample that you made. So this is the exact method that I use. Uh, Encyclopedia is one software that's out there, and the developers of this method wrote this software, but it now exists in other platforms as well. Um, but again, you are pooling everything, doing, these are DIA-based methods, but they're only looking at very small mass windows, and then you use this data to build your library and search your actual DIA data with. Other questions? Okay, I see you. So you asked about the library-free DIA option. So yeah, there I, I are. Think, oh, sorry. Ahead, I no, think spe SpectraNode has an alternative to do library-free DIA. So have you used that? Um, would you recommend using that? So the, what library-free DIA is, let's go see so if we can find a good example. So library-free DIA is basically saying, I have a whole list of fragment ions. I don't know that they come from the same thing. They all have the same elution profile, and I can separate them based on some peak detection algorithm that says these generally co-elute at the exact same time. I'm gonna group those product ions together, and I'm gonna make a pseudo MSMS spectrum, saying that the only the fragments of this mass of charge make an in silico spectrum that I can then search like a DDA spectrum. Then I assume that that's a peptide that I can match to a, like a, a sequence library that way. Now, those can be good, but they can also generate false hits or be less sensitive, and they can be an option if you don't have the ability to generate libraries. 
the first direct DIA method was called DIA umpire. And it's actually uh, made by Alessi Nabisky, who's giving a lecture tomorrow. And so the spectronaut methods borrow from his idea, but it's really this idea of grouping product ions that coelute, making them into just their own MSMS spectrum and searching that like you would a DDA. That can absolutely work, but they've been a lot, they've been interesting comparisons in the field of the trade-offs in both sensitivity and selectivity, which can be, you know, effectively the same thing depending on what your question is. But I think if you had no other option, they're great. I prefer this sample specific library generation because it is only the peptides from my library and it was collected using DIA methods that had the same type of selection mechanism happening for the library as they do for the samples. Thank you. I have time for one more. One more going once, twice, okay. So if you could share some of your slides. Oh yeah, so these are all being uh, recorded, uh, the whole talks, and uh, will be available to everybody. Yeah, so you've got you covered. Yeah, I should mention too, I intentionally tried to use slides from a lot of papers that had references. So when you go back and look, I hope I got all the references right. Most of them are, I know are right, I didn't double check every single one of them, but they should be more or less there. So they hopefully are great papers to read, not just for the figures, but the explanations in them are outstanding. Excellent. So I think this is an outstanding and in-depth overview of, of what options you have. Just would like to say you could probably pick any of those and get decent results. So I don't want you to feel like you got to sort through all of those methods plus the six new ones to have success. I think Nick did a great job of explaining all your options, but just know that like we're talking about, you know, 10 to 20 percent differences probably. So like it's going to work. So just pick what you like and go with it. Yeah. Would you agree? I, I do like pr roughly 50 percent DIA, 50 percent DDA in my own experiments. So it's like choose whichever one you're comfortable with and what you have the software to do. I think that's software you're comfortable with digging in your data and verifying that your answers are correct, that is an important factor too. So that determines a lot of what methods you might use too. Excellent. Thank you, Nick.